Hi, everyone. Um, very excited to have a couple of a very interesting panelists on here to talk about overhyped trends. Uh, George Matthew, who is CEO and chairman of Kespri, an aerial intelligence platform for drones, and Max Wessel, who's the chief innovation officer at SAP. So, guys, overhyped technologies. Let's just start right off with it. What do you think the overhyped technologies are right now? George, you want to kick us off? Sure. Well, I guess, Max, you were being a little naughty inviting a drone CEO on stage to talk <laughs> about overhyped technologies. So I think we're, we're at a point in the market where there are certain technologies that are reaching scale and adoption. Um, when I was in the data analytics business more recently at Alteryx uh, as the president before coming over to Casper, it was amazing to see how much evolved, particularly in the last five years. And at that point, big data was still very hyped. Right, And now you look at the scale, which Tableau just got bought by Salesforce. Alteryx has now reached $9 billion in market cap, and you're seeing that come to full fruition. I think when you look at some technologies like even where the drones are today, right? I mean, the Bloomberg article came out last Friday to talk about how much was invested into the drone market and what has been the return around it. I think in reality, in all of these cases, there is these moments of markets being overhyped, they correct themselves. You go through that trough of disillusionment, and as Gartner says, you come out to the slope of enlightenment, and every market goes through that. So we're seeing that right now in plenty of opportunities in the market, including blockchain, including drones, including a number of areas, particularly around synthetic biology. But all those will come out the other side, creating en enormous amounts of value, in my opinion. Mm. Max? Yeah, we, we um, were chatting about this earlier, and one of the things that I think is most important is you have to think about it in terms of timeline. Mm. Uh, overhyped is a function of when something will hit, sometimes whether it's going to hit at all, but in a lot of spaces, and I talk about this with our teams that are working on, for instance, quantum computing, that there is a huge amount of foundational work that had to happen in infrastructure and tooling to allow you to go into big data, harness, harness large disparate data sets, cleanse them, make it usable, such that we can have the amazing innovation that we see right now at the application layer. But there are T trends that we talk about sort of universally right now, for instance, with quantum, where there's a whole lot of hardware innovation that has to happen. Low-level technology innovation has to happen before any of the kind of groundbreaking uh, security application simulation work that is going to come out the other end. And I think if you take that lens, what's much more interesting to me is understanding not necessarily whether something has merit in and of itself, mm e.g. blockchain or quantum or whatever it might be, but what are the parts of that story that aren't going to hit in the next five to 15 years, right? What are the things that people are rushing like lemmings after mm -hmm. that, that require foundational innovation to happen before they're real? Yeah. So it sounds like timing is a big part of it. I feel like a good way to dig into this a little bit more is to, uh, is to, is to take a historical lens. I, I guess speaking personally, I came of age in tech uh, during the dot-com boom, and there were a lot of very skeptical people about some of those businesses. <coughs> and at least on the business side, that skepticism was warranted. But at the same time, you see the seeds of some of the largest companies in tech being sown right then. And a lot of those businesses that people were being skeptical of back then are now actually pretty successful businesses. Like, what can we learn from, from looking back? From, from like some company that ships books around? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I think that, you know, the best, the best stories seem transparent when you're looking backwards, yeah. but, but some people actually do have a 10-year Tesla master plan. We can talk about the legitimacy of the next 10 years, but I think uh -huh. the 10-year master plan was pretty powerful, and I think Amazon, with what they've done with distribution infrastructure and how they've built something kind of greenfield for the next generation is really important. Um, what, what I see from those examples of what worked and what didn't work was in a companies that appreciated what existed and what needed to exist before they could take the second and third steps, right? I had to prove that I could sell an electric car to a high-end market uh, and that I could m get it past a certain distance threshold before I could mass produce the thing. I had to, I mean, it's running a, it's a running a mission to the moon. You don't send your first rocket up 
in a manned mission with the intention of landing somebody on a lunar face, you do stage testing of how you're going to get there. Ladder up to the moon. That's right. <laughs> George? You know, it's funny, James, you mentioned uh, e-commerce. So I happen to have started my career in originally e-commerce in the mid-90s. So I was part of a company back in those days called Fort Point Partners. We had actually built some of the largest scalable e-commerce systems in the mid-90s all the way through the dot-com boom and bust. So Best Buy, Nike, J. Crew, Martha Stewart. Mm. Like these are all the sort of dot-com entities that we had built from a brick and mortar standpoint. But Max has a point around timing because back then when we had built those large-scale infrastructures, there was no application servers out there. BA didn't exist as an application server, ATG. And certainly now you see this kind of complete package solution with what Shopify offers in the market, and right. it's absolutely killed it. So we were initially doing that in this consulting. We actually had to pivot when the dot-com bust had occurred, and we built a landing page testing automation solution. Again, probably no one would have ever heard of. It was called Offermatica. Offermatica got bought by Adobe, mm. right? And, uh, well, actually, Omniture, and Omniture got bought by Adobe. And that's still landing page testing targeting inside of the Adobe suite. And it actually turns out it's just a question of timing, because the stuff that we had built back then, optimizely went on to build a massive company out of not more than three, four years later. So I think this concept of both timing and fundamental infrastructure and when it comes about is really important when it comes to thinking about when you can actually catch the wave. Yeah. If the timing is off and the fundamental capabilities of the infrastructure are not there, you're going to miss it, or you're not, you're just going to be too early. Yeah, and you bring up this in another point in that that's really important, which is in the late 90s, we had 270 million people connected via low bandwidth to the internet, and now we have 4.7 billion primarily with high bandwidth. I mean, even the, the low bandwidth mobile connections we have today are high bandwidth relative to what we all used to get online with, right? And the, the expansion of market also sustains businesses at different kind of levels of complexity and specification. So I, you couldn't imagine building a Shopify for right. the 270 million people of which maybe there were 10 million shoppers for all products globally. Right. But you can do that on mass today. And this is where, you know, when, when I spend time looking at the trends and the technological changes that may or may not impact SAP specifically, right, what we're focused on in a big way is understanding, like, is the technology going to work at all? Yes. Or is it, ma you know, fairy dust and, and magic? Um, is it going to work now? Does it require these foundational pieces? And then can the market possibly support it today? Um, and all of these things actually matter when you're trying to, to make a bet. And for the folks who, who are here, who are startup founders, who are thinking about putting, you know, putting blood, sweat, and tears and years into something, you really have to consider not just is this, is what I'm working on inspirational and transformative, but is it going to be able to sustain itself and its impact? Okay, rubber hits the road. Let's, let's double yeah. click on this. We have questions of timing. We have questions of foundational pieces. You're an operator, you're an entrepreneur, you're an investor. How do you know when is the right time or what is the right approach? How do you guys think about that? So I have a simple way of starting to frame this now. I think that the companies that use today's technologies to solve yesterday's problems do incredibly well and create a disproportionate amount of outcome in the space that they're in. And what I mean by that is if you look at some of the situations where you try to go race ahead and go adopt technology that isn't quite ready yet, try to go after a market that isn't quite there yet, and you try to build a company for the long term, you might eventually get there, but it is going to be a journey and a half, right? Uh, it, it's, it's interesting for me personally because when I joined Altrix from SAP in 2011, it was a pretty interesting moment because we had actually acquired business objects. I was part of the team that acquired business objects. I ended up running a big chunk of the business objects BI business. And so we saw this massive scale around the business intelligence tooling in that market at that moment. But this little tiny company came along called Tableau. And Tableau was actually doing something different for visual analysis and dashboarding that no one ever saw in the business analytics space prior. And we knew at that moment that there was something there, even inside of business objects, that there was a fundamental disruptive moment. And I just happened to 
think about that moment at that time and say, well, what's happening to follow that fundamental disruptive moment, which is, well, the data prep, the data blending, the, the, the predictive statistical algorithmic modeling needs to also follow those users. And literally, that was the thesis of initially SAP investing into Alteryx, and then, of course, Alteryx achieving the scale that it did. So when we look at those moments, it always has to be about, like, yes, the journey is hard. It, it was always going to be hard, no matter what startup, no matter what mid-stage, no matter what late-stage company you're involved with, the journey is always going to be hard. But have you at least figured out some level of structural tailwind to support you yeah. to make it through the journey? Yeah. The, I would interpret that as nothing is new, right? We do this. We, we have many, many of the same itches over and over again. And you can see it in, in technology. You can look at the history of how different markets evolved and what was the thing that we needed to solve for data governance in the legacy BI world mm -hmm. that we're solving now. But you see it you see it again in industry after industry, right? You think about uh, what Instacart's doing right now around promotions and advertising and it was like trade promotions is well understood in the grocery industry. But Instacart can create meaningful margin for a business that Webman was not able to do because they figured out that they're going to monetize on on the eyeballs, on the advertisements, on the TPM side of it, not the delivery side of it. And it's just understanding what was being solved for in the last paradigm and what will have to be solved for in order to sustain it moving forward. And that means everybody who's building a company has to be a historian. Let, let me give another fun, really fun example that's happening right now to, to chime off of what, what Matt said, uh, what Max said. When we look at this market around RPA, robotic process automation, right? What's been fascinating is there's been this market for business process outsourcing forever and a day, mm -hmm. right? And it's been out there. And frankly, some of the RPA technologies, you know, particularly in terms of optical character recognition, being able to integrate that to a process automation experience, those were also out there. But why did it matter right now? Right? It turns out that a lot of BPO companies got very, very fat and happy, mm -hmm. right? And they were charging insane amounts of dollars for being able to outsource business processes at scale. And the RPA vendors came in and said, well, you know, can we provide software for you to do $100 million of BPO for $10 million of software? And fundamentally <laughs> disrupted every single BPO opportunity out there with software. And so this is so this is an interesting tangent in because you also have this trend where in the valley, you know, we became obsessed with applying deep learning to many of these problems, right? right? And you looked at enterprise software, and you had every company, every new company was AI and ML applied to this. And I believe there are interesting technologies in you know in different RPA solutions, but the reality of it is this is not the most advanced thing in the world. Not at all. Right? It's understanding the problem that you're solving and applying technology that makes sense to that. And, and this, again, in, in our pursuit of overhyped technologies, right? you can become in love with the story of the technology mm -hmm. and not necessarily focused on the problem anymore. Interesting. Uh, I, I like that framing, um, but I, I actually want to take us on a slightly different tack for a second. Like, you, c you can get overhyped technologies because the timing is wrong. You can get overhyped technologies because, you know, the fundamental pieces aren't in place. But you can get overhyped technologies because, like, this thing is a dog, <laughs> one form or another. Um, I, I, I need to pick on something to bring this to life, but I remember back maybe 10 years ago, Second Life was this big thing and you had all these companies investing in it and creating islands or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously went nowhere. Is there uh, like thoughts on how to, uh, like it's, it's one thing to get the timing off, but thoughts on how to avoid going into one of these things that's just a black hole? Well, I, I will push back on your second life analogy oh, because okay. I, I think that... I'm going to push back too, but yeah. I'll see where Max goes. And <laughs> I feel like MMOs are a thing. You took my words right. out. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's possible for a play on a market to be wrong and still the market and the, the overall trend to be mm. right. But I, but I think, it, to your point, there are plenty of technologies that really, you know, you saw the hype happen and, and it didn't go where, where you expected. I'll say openly, you know, what was it? Four or five Five years ago, everybody in this, if we had this conference four or five years ago, everybody here would have been talking about IoT. Mm. And not IoT necessarily the way you might be looking at it yep. now, which is standard sensors, standard deployment, ways of getting new feed. But everybody was talking about like these new sensors that were coming out and how things were going to get into different use cases and you were going to transform every industrial process. And no one 
looked at what the infrastructure was in place and how you were going to deploy these things. And you look now five years later and you have a heavy services play. So there are lots of people who've applied technology to automate business process in oil fields, wherever it might be. But a lot of the companies that, that were out there shipping like out of the box IoT platforms, it was something that may have worked in a lab. But if you looked anywhere else in the world, it was clear that it wasn't going to work the way it was being described. So I'll give you an example of this since, since you mentioned the, the IoT oil field example. So without naming the super major that Casper is happening to be working with right now, the image video processing technology within Casper right now is actually being applied to an undersea robotic rover that's collecting nine terabytes of undersea pipeline footage where we're now analyzing and processing where are the fishing nets, where are the rocks, where are the motion deviations? Where is the sand impeding the progress of and the health of that pipeline? Where is the corrosion detection? In fact, the corrosion detection module is an ML model that the super major built and they're deploying on the Casper cloud infrastructure. So notice in that entire discussion, I never mentioned the word drone. It actually turns out that the same ingredients, the same technology that started Casper from a drone standpoint is now being applied for the scaled out video image processing from the super major sending us the data of the undersea rover footage. And I, so, so I think in many of these cases, we, we get upset when the technology isn't quite there at that moment and just killed it. Second Life being a great example, mm. right? Well, guess what? Second Life generated an entire generation of MMOs, right? My daughter plays Fortnite like pretty much every day. I gotta like grab the iPhone, uh, the iPad out of her hands. And it's because, you know, it is for companies like Second Life existing in the first place that that was even possible. Mm. So I think that is something that we always forget. When I was at Salesforce, uh, Mark Benioff and Parker Harris used to say this all the time. It's like, it's pretty impressive how much we end up completely overestimating the things that we can do in a year, but we yeah. end up underestimating the things that happen in a decade. Yep. And it's so true, right? And that happens over and over again, particularly in this sort of concept of overhyped technology. Um, I, we, we, we're getting close on time, but I feel like that's a pretty nice segue into looking out into the future. Um, the technologies right now that uh, you think that are at risk of being overhyped, but uh, you're excited about looking out 10 years? So I am very excited about what's happening in, so th this is gonna be an anti-enterprise uh, pitch because normally like you're ostracized for this opinion, but I think middleware and application development platforms are going to see a resurgence that you haven't seen in a long time because you know, the ability to connect, you know, if whether it's whether it's uh, using an integration platform as a service, whether it's using something as simple as Zapier or whatever it is, I think the ability for us in 10 years to be ac be able to create somewhat complex applications is going to be quite high. Today, I can barely get you know a Microsoft Flow to work to get my email depositing a file in OneDrive, but I think 10 years from now that is really going to be there, and you're going to see the enterprise landscape change pretty dramatically because of it. Yes. George? So I'm going to go outside the enterprise world. Um, I happen to have had an undergraduate degree in neurobio, so uh, it's funny to see computational neurobio come back together again 25 years later. Um, when I graduated, that was a useless degree, but uh, particularly to go into anything related to, to technology. But now to see synthetic biology and specifically the movement around CRISPR, mm. uh, I, I don't know if you caught the news even like two weeks ago, they've now figured out a way to apply CRISPR not to edit one gene, but to edit n number of genes simultaneously. So we are right at that moment where you can now see all kinds of opportunities for both um, just expressive gene interpretation of you know what you can um, reduce as far as the amount of like imperfections that happened uh, genetically speaking in the genome as well as the possibility for all kinds of synthetic biology opportunities that just haven't even opened up again yeah. and that's happening in the next 10 years without a doubt super cool all right well i think we've uh, done our part to add a little bit of uh, hype 
to a, on a panel about overhyped technology, <laughs> which I feel like is a nice way. To but notice it. we we managed to get through the panel without talking about some specific things. Right? Yes, <laughs> yes, very good, George Max. Thank you very much. This has been great. Thanks a lot, James. Thank Appreciate you. It.